My name is Dave McJanet, HashiCorp CEO. I get to spend a lot of my time with some of the largest companies in the world as they think through this infrastructure transition to cloud that they're all going through. Here I wanted to step back a minute and maybe just share how we think about the market transition that's underway uh, and how that then informs our product evolution. I think the, the big picture of what we're seeing is that at the infrastructure layer, the world's going through a transition that we go through once every 20 years and we're going today from a world where predominantly infrastructure is running on premises uh, in kind of a static environment and that is typically in either infrastructure that you own or that you are you know, long-term leasing <laughs> to a world where you know, perhaps this was running on premises. Today, you're moving to really a world of running infrastructure that is much more dynamic in nature. And that's the fundamental shift that's happening. Today, you may have some running on your private cloud, but then you will have some running on Amazon. You might have some running on Azure. Uh, you may have some running on GCP, et cetera. The, the core distinction is, is pretty profound as it relates to the operating model for infrastructure. Um, simply stated, this world is extraordinarily dynamic, and therefore, every organization we engage with has to think about how they are navigating this transition from running infrastructure this way to this way. The easiest way then to think about it is, is to sort of decompose it into the core pieces. So let's just talk about how infrastructure is provisioned uh, in these two different worlds. So the way I provision infrastructure here is really predicated on a static set of servers that I own. Here, so it's basically, you know, really the, the static uh, idea. In this world here, I, I don't just stand up 100,000 servers and leaving, leave them running on Amazon. It's much more, much more sort of on demand. So I move into a world of provisioning uh, essentially infrastructure on demand. At the, sec the security layer, the implications are pretty different. You're going from a world really that is basically you know, a high trust environment with a clear network perimeter. And therefore I can use uh, IP address as the basis for security to the new world where in the dynamic world, you really have to think about, wait a second, this is fun fundamentally a low trust environment. And therefore I have to think about what else can I use rather than IP as the basis of, of, of security. I, so I move to the world of identity as the basis of security. For the core networking, well, the challenge is, again, slightly different. In this world, everything has a physical server host, so I can then have an IP address that's based on that specific server host. And so fundamentally, it's host-based uh, connectivity, right? Everything's predicated on a physical machine that's running over there. Well, in this new world here, there's no notion of a physical machine, and therefore, I have to think of, think of the world in terms of services. So the world moves to one of basically service-based uh, connectivity. Right? So maybe it's a database or an app server. Where is it in this new world? And they use that as the basis for connectivity, recognizing that it's going to move around. And then for the application developer, well, I'm no longer deploying an application to a physical uh, you know, uh, lo location. I'm deploying an application perhaps using something that's running across the distributed fleet. So it's basically I'm deploying an application to a fleet. So, at its core, this represents a completely different model for how to think about infrastructure relative to the world that we're all familiar with. How are most of our customers think about it is they then decompose the problem into, wait a second, there are four core people in my IT organization. There are ops people, there are security people, there are uh, the development function, and then there's essentially a, call it a networking uh, uh, group. All four people have to figure out how to navigate this transition. And that is the core challenge of cloud adoption at scale, is recognizing that all four of them need to understand the implications of this new model. So the way that we then uh, think about it is to say, well, wait a second, let's talk about the ops person. How has their world changed? Their world has changed in really three ways. One is fundamentally in terms of scale. So the scale of the infrastructure that I'm provisioning here may be 50 VMs. The scale of infrastructure I'm provisioning here may be 50,000 machines. So the scale challenge is just a different one as it relates to, to, to the provisioning uh, exercise. The second challenge is one of variety. Uh, most of our large uh, Global 2000 customers are running not just on the private data center, but also some workloads on Amazon, some on Azure, some on Google, some on Alibaba. Uh, and therefore, the challenge for the ops team is how do I provision infrastructure across this variety of, of, of target platforms? And then lastly, the challenge is one of managing dependencies. We'll just call it dependencies. 
So as I'm provisioning infrastructure as a core policy in this world, I need to provision the monitoring agents and the connectivity aspects that are perhaps specific to my environment. Well, how do I include those components in that new world as well? So for us, Terraform plays that role and Terraform is extraordinarily popular. Uh, it is not our most popular product, but it, uh, it's certainly up there. Um, and it's used as, to provide a consistent provisioning experience for this new cloud operating model that allows people to leverage all the innovation coming out of these uh, core, core different platforms um, without providing a lowest common denominator uh, across all of them. So the way Terraform actually works is relatively simple. Terraform really has two parts. There's Terraform Core, and then there's a, a provider for every environment you want to interface to. So there's an Amazon provider, there's an Azure provider, there's a GCP provider, uh, it's, there's a vSphere provider, et cetera. And what Terraform does by decoupling this, much like a middleware broker and adapter would do, it allows me to be able to expose all 220 services on Amazon that I want to invoke and provision, uh, plus perhaps you know, on Azure, obviously, they don't have 220 servers. They have different services. Then maybe they only have 150. On GCP, maybe there's 120 services, et cetera. The, the idea here is these cloud providers are going to continue investing for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and you want to be able to expose the core services that those providers are going to make available over that period of time. And so by adopting this core plus provider model, what you allow for is every time Amazon introduces, introduces a new capability, it's now made available in the Amazon provider for, te for, for Terraform for everybody to consume. So there are in fact two categories of, of, of providers for, uh, for Terraform. There are the core infrastructure platforms, but, but invariably you're not just provisioning compute capacity when you're provisioning infrastructure, you need to, compute, need to configure something on top of that as well. So as a result, there are about 150 today, and that number grows every week, other kinds of providers, whether that's for Palo Alto Networks, or F5, or Kubernetes, or Datadog, you know, pick, take, take your pick. These are things that are part of the provisioning uh, process that want to be uh, uh, deployed uh, on, on top of the core compute. What, what you can then do is people then create a Terraform template which includes, for example, the configuration of maybe the, the three Amazon services that you are interested in, plus the configuration for Datadog and Kubernetes and uh, you know, F5 and Palo Alto Networks. And that, and that becomes a reusable template that anybody can provision. So what you now have is the ability to deploy, essentially in a codified manner, an infinite amount of infrastructure in a very repeatable way. And that is not just including the, the, the core cloud services, but also the, 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 the other aspects you want to configure as well. So that, that, that is why Terraform is extraordinarily widely used by operators in this new model. At the security layer, well, the problem is also pretty profound, and we talk about it here. You're basically going from a high trust network to a low trust network. And therefore, you need to assume um, that, that your network is not secure. That's a safe, that's a safe assumption. It is secure, but it's, but it's now outside of your control, so a safe assumption is that it's not. So the problem here becomes, number one, how do I protect secrets? How do I do secrets management? So secrets management being things like database usernames and passwords that previously in this world I could just leave unprotected. In this world, you know, that's, that's, that's not, 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 a, not, a, not, not a solid approach. So you need to centralize your approach to how you're managing secrets. And secrets can be of all types, whether that's a database username and password or it could be a login to a system. Um, you fundamentally need to assume that those things should be protected in a different way than they were previously. The second challenge is one of encryption. I should also assume that if I can encrypt everything both in flight and at rest across this distributed fleet, then it's actually okay that the network is, is low trust. So therefore, I need some way of addressing the encryption challenge uh, in addition to the secrets management challenge here. And then lastly, I need to be able to use identity as the basis of, of access uh, rather than physical IP address. Recognizing, though by the way, each of these environments has a different identity model. For example, I might use Active Directory on-premises, the Amazon IAM model on Amazon, Azure Active Directory on Azure, Google IAM model on Google, you start to get a sense for the challenge. So this is how Terraform works, as I described here. The way that, the way that um, Vault, which is extraordinarily widely used to address the challenge of cloud security, is, is really to think about 
how things used to work and then how things uh, work today. In the old world, what we would do is you would have a client, basically, or a client, connect to a backend system like a database, and I would pass the username and credentials and get back information from that, uh, from that end user. In a high trust network, that's a valid approach. In this new world, you need to insert a secondary step, and that's where Vault comes in. Vault inserts itself in the middle of this particular flow and says, let me authenticate against some sort of trusted source, source of, of identity that I already trust. And th there aren't that many of those in a typical organization. As I said, for your on-prem, it's probably Active Directory or LDAP, or it could be Amazon IAM or the IAM model of the cloud provider. It could be OAuth from GitHub. It could be Okta, you know, whatever uh, system of record you trust. And then the way that Vault then enforces it is when the client makes a request, rather than going directly to the database or the backend system, a database is an example of a system, but it could be uh, uh, you know, any kind of system or application. The request is made to Vault. Vault then authenticates that request uh, of you know, I am, who are you, do you exist in my records, and then it grants access to uh, the backend system and it returns, in fact, a token. And that token is what's given back to that requesting client. The policy associated with that token is defined by the security team. And that is where the sort of the handoff and the recognition that there are multiple parties involved here comes in is that I can now give my developers and my ops team a single place to go to access a system or an application and the, and the policy associated with, with how long that credential lasts, for example, uh, is defined by the security team. So I as a security team might say, hey, every time this client makes a request, you know, let it, let, give it a token that lasts for one second or 30 seconds or one day, or whatever that condition might be. That's the basic idea of, of how Vault helps people address the reality that they are now operating in a low trust uh, network. There's also a uh, uh, transit backend. We, th we have this idea of basically auth backends and system backends. Same way that Terraform has the idea of providers, uh, Vault has this idea of backends. An auth backend, there's a limited number of authentication mechanisms and, uh, that, that you might have. Um, but those are all supported in, in Vault. Uh, I can be fairly confident. But then there's essentially an infinite number of system backends. Maybe it's for an Oracle database or an SAP uh, HANA database or, or an application system. But there's also an, uh, a transit backend that allows uh, Vault to act as essentially uh, a certificate authority to, to encrypt data across your fleet. So without changing the workflow of the application, you can now start to encrypt by policy everything in that flow. And that's how Vault addresses the, the challenges of running in a low trust network. The, the third layer uh, is, well, now your developers in this new world have to figure out how to navigate this new way of deploying applications. And frankly, their job is much easier than anybody else's. The core challenge here is, hey, you're going to have heterogeneity at this layer. You're going to have some Java apps. You're going to have some C Sharp apps. You're going to have some, you know, call them .NET apps. .NET apps. You're going to have some Hadoop apps. You're going to have some container-based apps. You're going to have some VMs. And the challenge becomes one, one, one really that we categorize in two, in, in, two, in two parts. One is, how do I separate the concerns from my developer having to know where everything is going to run? It shouldn't matter. They just get to say, I want to deploy this application. This is what this application needs. Number two, the challenge is one of essentially binary packing. If I'm spinning up 100,000 servers for my applications, I'm paying for them all. And therefore, how can I schedule, essentially, the, the, the core scheduling function of scheduling these apps to efficiently use that infrastructure? And Nomad is extraordinarily widely used to do that. Right? If you have uh, container applications that, that you are using something like Kubernetes for, you know, it's very, very common for people to use Kubernetes for some of those pieces, Nomad for some of the other pieces. Cloud Foundry for some of the other those pieces, uh, uh, Java yeah, or basically a Java application server for some of those pieces. The point is there will be heterogeneity at this layer. The last challenge is one of, uh, you know, the fundamental challenge of this model is actually knowing where everything is. You're now spinning up things across a, a distributed environment, and so our most widely used product is in fact uh, console. And console uh, is deployed across really every, every machine that, 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 that runs in, in, in these distributed environments as the system of record that tells you where everything is. So it really serves a, a few different purposes. The first of those, it acts as a dynamic service registry that tells you where everything is in this distributed world. 
So when an application gets deployed, here's the latest uh, version of that method. For the ops teams, it acts as a dy dynamic infrastructure registry. Hey, where is everything? How many app servers do I have running? How many containers are running in my, my, my environment? Where is, where is the database? So previously, I would have described when I deployed, as an example, a, a, a database into my environment, it would, it would have an IP address, 1.1.1.1. In this new world, well, because everything's moving around, people use console to say, basically, I'm deploying this database. Here it is. It's DB1. Okay? And then that becomes the basis of how you communicate with it rather than the IP address. So it acts as this common registry and backbone that allows you to establish a mesh of where all the services are in your environment. And as I said, console is by far our most widely used product. And it's used not just in the container landscape. It's used for fronting mainframes and basically everything in between. And lastly, the last component of the last use case of console is certainly once we have all the services registered and discovered, so I know I have 100,000 databases in my, in, my, in my environment, you can then use console to enforce connectivity in terms of what, what service can connect, connect to what service. So for the security teams, console plays a role in terms of service connectivity. And it's because uh, the core challenge of how I actually enable applications to see the light of day in this new world is fundamentally a security one. The console connect capability within console, which is what allows the connectivity, is what really makes console so powerful as a common uh, service mesh to underpin uh, this distributed fabric of, of compute you've now set up. So that's how we think about the pieces. And I think the, 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 the seminal takeaway for me is the fact that we are going through this transition to a different operating model for infrastructure from you know, static to dynamic. And we think about it in terms of a cloud operating model. That cloud operating model, actually very often we see adopted on premises, but it's a different mindset. It's about ephemeral infrastructure. It's about assuming low trust. It's about dynamic IP addresses. It's moving to software-based everything. And that, while it came to, to bear uh, as a result of this transition to cloud, is just as uh, relevant on premises. For example, there's a vSphere provider for Terraform, right? And that's how people do that. People use Vault on-premises uh, very often to, 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 because the idea of a low trust network is actually a good idea. So number one, we're going through the shift as, a, as an industry. Number two, the best way we found to, to uh, describe it is to actually decompose it into the problems for each person or per, certainly uh, you know, practitioner type inside the IT organization, and in so doing, establish a common operating model that allows our customers to adopt cloud.